Progress of Christian Missions, Part 2, Acts 18, 18 to 28. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy at the close of his life, when he wrote the second epistle to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 2, he says this, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And he said to Timothy also, concerning his life with the law, the life of service, he says, for the cause, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He tells us that the Christian life, life with God, is not a promise of a bed of roses, but the Christian life can be fraught with trials and temptations, and that the people of God must not be under any illusion that when you become a Christian, you will have no problems. In fact, You may have more, but the Lord Jesus Christ promised when He was on earth to His disciples, He says that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. One generation of Christians who walk faithfully with the Lord at the end of their life, what is the greatest hope? Well, the greatest hope is to be able to pass on that faith to the next generation. Pass on that faith. You know, you can pass them the physical things of this earth, but it will not help them that much. But if you pass them the wherewithal to live this life, then you find that you have passed to them something precious, something that they can take hold of to run their life, whether in poverty or in riches. They know what to do, how to live their life. So the Apostle Paul tells Timothy that since he became a Christian, life was not easy. In fact, it was fraught with danger. He said to the Corinthian church, he says, for I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. But this life with God involves the carrying of the cross, a consecration of the life that involves sacrifice in discipleship. And the Lord wants us to count the cost. And so the Apostle Paul said, for we were made a spectacle unto the world. We are fools for Christ's sake. And he says that we are weak, we are despised, even unto this present hour. We both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labour working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted. We suffer it. Not easy. Being persecuted, we suffer it. We're not going to retaliate. We're not going to fight back. We're going to let God to protect us to lead, to guide us, 
to depend on the grace of God to hold us. And so he tells Timothy, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Jesus Christ. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. While we are given the Bible, the written Word of God, at the same time, we realize how it is preserved and communicated in and through the lives of God's people. You realize, you see uh, that many Christians, it is observed, seldom read the Bible. And it is no wonder that many do not grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. After becoming Christians, there, is, there seemed to be that stagnation over there. But for the child of God, we, we are to grow. We are to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how can we manifest that power of God in our lives? Except when we would imbibe the Word of God in our lives, that there would be true joy in our hearts when we face trials, when we face temptations, when we face difficulties in life, we do not capitulate to the trials. But there is an inner strength within us to know how to live life, whatever is thrown at us. This was the life of the Apostle Paul. This was the life that he wanted to pass to Timothy at the end of his life. He tells Timothy, that we are in a spiritual battle and the evil one is relentless attacking the truth of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And so he trained Timothy to be a man just like him and he sets the example of consecration and devotion to his Lord for his spiritual son to follow. So if, you, if we want to pass our spiritual heritage to our children, the best way is to imbibe the life of God in our hearts. And we have to work on our spiritual life. That the fruit of the Spirit of God may be manifested. And we see here how Timothy is given that spiritual mandate right, to pass the faith to faithful men who may be able to teach others also. And you see how God has energized, sustained, and caused His servant to constantly yield himself to God. You know, this life that we live as a Christian, if we do not actively yield our life to the leading of the Spirit of God, the flesh can take over. And when the flesh takes over, it's ugly. Then you say that, yeah, we are a child of God. The Spirit of God is supposed to be in us. And yet you find the manifestation of our flesh so sad. That's why you see in the life of the Apostle Paul, there is that constant consecration and reconsecration of his life to God. He's always seeking to draw close to God, that the Spirit of God may fill him and that he is concerned for the people around him. 
that there may be others who may be built up in the faith. So the two thoughts that we want to see from our text here is this, dedication and devotion for service, 2018 to 23, and discipleship for service, 24 to 28. This first thought, dedication and devotion for service, uh, brings us to the spring of AD 52. The Apostle Paul, in the second missionary journey, has spent more than three and a half years out in the field. The church in Corinth was established, and he was there leaving Corinth and returning to his base church in Antioch in Syria. And he sought to go to Jerusalem to worship in Jerusalem. It's very interesting that this man of God would want to take time to go back to the temple in Jerusalem. At that time, the temple is still there. And, you know, it is a manifestation of the presence of God. Although Jesus Christ has completed the work of redemption, uh, He saw that as a symbol of the presence of God, because it was a temple that was built, right, the second temple in Jerusalem. And you see that this man and his mind is wholly given over to God and given over to the life that God would have for him. And so here we notice in our text in verse 18, uh, um, it says here that after he tarried there, where is that place? In Corinth, in a, the region of Achaia, in Greece, modern day Greece, he tarried for a good while. Then he took leave of his brethren and sailed to Syria. And with him was Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila, we will come to it, uh, dedicated couple who served together with him in the Lord, ten makers, right? And it says here at the end of verse 18 that he has shown his head in Sancria. Well, Sancria is the seaport right? uh, just at the edge of Achaia, of Corinth. Okay? That was where he would sail all the way back. Right? He would stop in Ephesus for a while, then from there he would go all the way back to Antioch in in Syria. And, and we noticed here uh, in our text uh, how he had shown his head and because he had a vow. What vow was that? Well, I submit to you that it was a vow that he has taken of consecration. You may be called in the Jewish tradition a Nazarite vow. And the uh, Jews uh, uh, would often uh, do that right, for a short period, 30 days, right, in which they would dedicate themselves to the Lord all over again. And in that vow, they would abstain from uh, wine, abstain from impurity, contact with the dead, and leave the hair undone, uncut. And uh, uh, only at the end of the consecration would he, the hair be cut and the hair would be brought to the temple in Jerusalem for a sacrifice uh, to God. So you see that this man uh, uh, of God is one who loves the Lord very much. And in his life, he seeks to be uh, acquainted seek his life to be drawn closer to, to the Lord through his devotion and through his rededication to God. You know, we are going to have our church camp. And church camp is a time when the people of God gather right, once a year where we will have continual uh, spiritual feeding 
for a number of days where we take time out of the busyness of all our schedule to reaffirm our bearing with God in our lives. So he has spent four and a half years out in the field and he wanted to make sure that his own spiritual life is well. And he went through, you know, remember he, he was a, a Jewish rabbi. Right? He was trained by Gamaliel and he understood uh, the traditions of the Jewish religion very well. He was a man who was consecrated right, to the Jewish faith and he understood right, when Christ appeared to him, the link right, between the Old Testament and its fulfillment in the New Testament through the person of Jesus Christ. Right. He, he understood this and, and he in his life of service to God, sought to keep his hope alive. Do you take time off in your spiritual journey to spend time with God? Well, there was a, a man of God. He was a missionary to the Red Indians, uh, David Brennan, and he spoke about how he spent a day with God. You know, he would take a day off and that he would have his scriptures, he would have his hymn, and he would go to a quiet place where he would spend time praying, spend time reading the Word of God and spend time having spiritual orientation. Now you see the Apostle Paul in his life has that kind of a consecration to God. And in the Bible, it is not a rare thing for people of God to dedicate, rededicate their life to God so that they want to live a life of purity, they want to live a life of consecration to God to remember how if we would choose the way of sin, the way of the flesh, we are going to be hurt badly. And we know the impact, not only upon ourselves, but the people around us. If you are a family man, right, your sin will affect all the people around you. The decisions that we make in life will affect the people around us. And I can remember uh, the man Daniel when he was transported to Babylon. Right? Uh, Jerusalem was taken down, the first temple was destroyed and he was there as a young man and how he consecrated himself to the Lord. Uh, the Bible tells us he purposed in his heart, uh, Daniel 1.8, that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine that he drank. And he had that kind of a purpose in his heart, that kind of a consecration, a kind of a conviction to want to walk with God and how he indeed had his mind settled and fixed. You know, if you don't spend time to understand the will of God for your life, how you are to follow the will of God, the commandments of God, then when it comes to the crunch, when it comes to the time when you have to make a decision, you do not have the word of God with you in your heart, you may stumble making a decision in the flesh that you would regret. And so the Lord wants us to, to be firm in our mind, firm in our hearts, right, to know the will of God and a time when we would want to, you know, rededicate our lives to God. We have the Lord's Supper. 
Right? Monthly, we partake the Lord's Supper. And during the time of the Lord's Supper, we come with preparation of heart. Right? We come searching our hearts in self-examination before we partake the Lord's Supper, right? where we have gone astray, where we have sinned against God. We make right with God. And then when we take of the, partake of the elements, we find faith, a renewal of faith. And so the Christian need to, to constantly seek to reconsecrate their lives to God, their devotion to God, so that our life will not be uh, humdrum and lukewarm, to keep the fire burning in our heart. And the Apostle Paul had that kind of uh, dedication in his life. He says, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I choose, I would not. For I am in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. You know, uh, if you have lived life, up to a certain point in time, you said that, Lord, take me home. I'm ready. Right? The Apostle Paul has reached a stage in his life where he's ready to go. And we too, you know, are you ready to be with the Lord? When he would call you, we must be ready. This life on earth is just tem temporal. You see, you can be here well, but the next day, you may not be here. But the Bible tells us, absent in the body, present with the Lord. Right? So this was the life of the Apostle Paul. He was living you know, at the edge of heaven, as it were. He says, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you, he said to the Philippian church. We live, we continue to live life, wake up in the morning, and up about our duties, because there are people around us who need us that we can be a blessing for, that we can do something for them. That's the life of the, uh, this man, Paul. I, I know that I shall abide and continue with you for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me. He says, you see, his life is given wholly to God, given wholly to the people of God. Right? Nothing is held back. Uh, there was this man called Jonathan Edwards. He lived in the 1700s during the time of the Great Awakening in America. There was a great revival during that time and he was a revivalist preacher. And this was his life, he says, I claim no rights to myself, no rights to this understanding, this will, these affections that are in me. Neither do I have any right to this body or its members, no right to this tongue, no right to these hands, feet, ears and eyes. He says, I have given myself clear away and not retain anything of my own. I have been to God this morning and told Him I have given myself wholly to Him. I have given Him my every power so that for the future I claim no rights to myself in any respect. And He says, I will fight with all my might against the world, the flesh and the devil to the end of my life. I will adhere to the faith of the gospel. I will pray for others' sake to look upon this as a, self, as a self dedication and receive me as his own. If I murmur, 
in the least at afflictions. He says that, you know, when difficulties come my way, if I were to murmur, if I'm in any way uncharitable, if I revenge my own case, if I do anything purely to please myself and omit anything because it is a great denier, if I trust to myself, if I take any praise of any good which Christ does by me, or I am in any way proud, I shall act as my own and not God's. I purpose to be absolutely His. This was the life of the Apostle Paul. At the end of the second missionary journey, and it's interesting that if you were to read uh, the verse there, he says that he had a vow. He has consecrated himself to the Lord. And verse, uh, verse uh, 22 and 23 uh, speaks of his return to Antioch. He says that from Sancria, he would land at Caesarea. Where is Caesarea? It's at the sea coast of the Mediterranean Sea, just off Antioch. Okay, and there he would travel by land back to Antioch. So, verse 22 gives to us the end of the second missionary journey. He has spent four and a half years away. And then it's very interesting that in verse 23, it's a description of the beginning of the third missionary journey. It's as if he had no rest. But there is a time lapse Okay, you would see that he would begin his missionary journey, third missionary journey, only in AD 54. That was AD 52 that we were speaking about. So here you, you see um, there is in, the, in our text uh, a description of the third missionary journey. Right, verse 23 says, After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. So here we said that he was a man who sought the Lord. Right? He sought to go to Jerusalem uh, to re-consecrate himself, to go to the temple of God, to observe the feast. Uh, it is not mentioned what feast. That's in verse 21. And he says, I will go back and serve again. So we need you know, you see in all this text uh, a description of how he sought to strengthen his own spiritual life so that he can continue his service for the Lord. Right? Whether he take vow, whether he fast, uh, whether he spend time, you know, away, but this was what he did right? in order to keep himself strong for the Lord. And this is what we can learn from the life of this man, the Apostle Paul. Right? How he sought to keep close to God through prayer, through the Word. This is how we can keep close to God. And then from verse 24 to 28 is a description of uh, a different scene before us. Right, discipleship for service. Right, that's a very interesting uh, 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 turn here. Right, we are told that there was a certain man called Apollos. He was a Jew from Alexandria. Now, where is Alexandria? Alexandria, our text tells us, uh, uh, or, uh, uh, when you uh, study uh, the, the map, you would see that it is uh, somewhere uh, in uh, the northern edge of Egypt, right, close to Palestine. Uh, it, it is a centre of learning, just like Athens. You remember, we were studying Athens just two, three weeks ago. It was also a centre of learning. I remember Paul went to Mars Hill. Uh, he was trying to share with them the gospel. And then he was asked to go to Mars Hill. That was the center of knowledge. Okay, if you have some new thing to say, well, you, you come there and then, you know, let it, be, uh, let it be said and let it be evaluated. Okay, Alexander was another such place, a place of learning. And he, <clears throat> there was this man called 
Apollos. And it's interesting that God will use uh, Paul's companion, uh, which we mentioned earlier, uh, the, the couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. You remember we, we studied that two weeks ago? Uh, this couple, uh, they met the Apostle Paul uh, because they were extradited from Rome. Right? Uh, the Emperor Claudia was... Uh, 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 there was a persecution of the Jews and the Jews were extradited from Rome and then Aquila and Priscilla came all the way to Corinth and met Paul. Right? Paul was there and they met each other and then they began you know, to work there. Uh, they were all ten makers. Okay? So this uh, humble Jewish couple okay, who labour with their hands... Uh, had spent time with the Apostle Paul. Okay. And, you know, during those times that they spent together, Paul would have taught them the way of God in Jesus Christ. You spend time together with a man of God. You spend time to know God better right? in your conversation, you know, in your meals, in your walk. Right. You speak about life with God. And this was what they did, this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. How they were Paul's companion. Right. And, you know, this, the book of uh, Romans tells us uh, that this couple was very precious to the Apostle Paul. How were they precious? Well, they gave or they... they did not count their life or they, they are willing to give their life for the comfort, for the, for the safety of the Apostle Paul. We are not told, you know, what danger took place, right? but this couple were, you know, close co-workers and friends uh, willing to serve together and there... Uh, we are told uh, the Apostle Paul uh, were with them in uh, Ephesus. Then, and after that, uh, uh, Paul left to go to Antioch, but they left uh, Aquila and Priscilla there. And then there was this man, Apollos, who came. Uh, who is this man? Uh, we are told that uh, he came from Egypt and that he was one who was instructed in the way of God. He was an eloquent man. Mighty in the scriptures. So this man, a single man, okay, uh, came to meet this couple, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, and uh, they saw right, how uh, he was mighty in the scriptures. He was, uh, what we said, uh, the word eloquent, uh, an intellectual. Okay, an intellectual. And you see also that uh, Alexander... It was a place of learning. There was a large Jewish uh, community in Alexandria, and uh, during that time, uh, there were uh, uh, more than 100,000 Jews there in Alexandria, and it was there that the Hebrew Scriptures was translated to Greek, and it was there that there was this famous Jewish writer by the name of Philo, or Philo, uh, who lived and uh, who translated the Old Testament scriptures, and he was there uh, at that during those times. And uh, Apollos must have learned the word of God in the Old Testament from him. And so this man came preaching the word of God according to John the Baptist. What did John the Baptist? preach. Well, John the Baptist called men and women to repent, to repent of their sins, right, of a Messiah. But it is interesting that this man did not know that the Messiah has come, that this, this man has not known uh, that uh, Jesus Christ, the Messiah whom he preached, uh, has come, has died, you know, for the sins of the world, and three days later rose again from the dead. And so this man was there preaching eloquently, uh, 
but he had not the fullness of the understanding of the Scriptures. And so Priscilla and Aquila, having known, uh, took him aside, probably, you know, over lunch, over dinner, uh, shared with him, our text tells us, expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Basically, he pre they preached the gospel to him. That Jesus Christ came, how he died, and three days later, he rose again from the dead. And how, you see, we need to be instructed in the word of, in the way of God more perfectly. The Bible Presbyterian Church began uh, as uh, the Bible Presbyterian Church of the United States of America when our founding pastor went to Faith Seminary 1948 to study the Word of God. And there he imbibed the doctrine of the pre-millennial return of Christ. That Christ would return bodily to rule upon earth for a thousand years. Well, that is the, what we said, the literal description of uh, the Revelation chapter 20. Uh, but if you were to look at the Reformed faith, uh, uh, you, you'd find that the, the Reformers, uh, they do not speak about a millennium where Christ would return and rule upon earth for a thousand years. It was not, in a sense, relevant to them. During the time of the Reformation, the 15th, 16th century, what happened? Well, there was no Israel in the land. Since AD 70, they have been dispersed. The temple was destroyed. No temple. So what is the fulfillment for Israel? And it's interesting that we in our generation, we saw how God brought the Jews back to the land again, 14th of May, 1948. And our founding father was there in uh, faith seminary and he learned Right, from the dispensationalist, right, this group of theologians, the faith of the pre-millennial return of Christ. Because the reformers were all amillennial. They do not believe or they do not uh, uh, speak about the 1,000-year rule of Christ upon earth. Why is it so important? Because we are living in the last of the last days. When Christ would return, and the Bible tells us that we will be there in the millennium, ruling with Christ on earth physically, you see, we are living in those times where the rapture could take place at any time. And so there, he understood, he learned the, about the pre-doctrine of the pre-millennial return of Christ so that we understand what the future will be for us. That there is a, a literal uh, fulfillment right, where Christ would destroy all the enemies right, when the Antichrist would arise upon earth he would return bodily and he would establish his millennial kingdom on earth. Why is it so important? Because it could be in our generation or in our children's generation that all this would take place. And so when our founding pastor learned the doctrine of the pre-millennial return of Christ, his heart was warmed. His heart was uh, very much uh, uh, inclined to understand the, the plan of God for the Jews. 
Why is the plan of God for the Jews so important? Well, because God did not forsake them, although they were very wayward, although they rejected God, although they don't want God in their lives, God would still lovingly await a time when He would save all Israel. And this is a picture of the kindness, the picture of the mercy of God for us too. You see, the way God would deal with the Jews, the same way God would deal with us. And if we have understood, you know, this last day's doctrines, we would know and we would be prepared right, that Christ would come any time, you know, when we establish this church, the Blessed Hope Bible Presbyterian Church. Why did we call ourselves Blessed Hope? because we were living in the last of the last days and we believe a literal fulfillment of the book of Revelation that God, Christ, would come again, return and receive His church to glory and that it can come anytime and that we need to be a people who is prepared because it can be in our generation. And so the Lord gave us that name. Uh, our pastoral advisor uh, invited us to the house and we were, I was praying, praying to the Lord what was to be the name of the church. How do you name a church? How do you name a church? It's not some, something beyond us, right? Yeah, but we know that we are living in the last days. And so when he spoke and he said, the blessed hope, well, that name came, one of the two, three names that came to us and then we submitted to the registry of societies and they came out, they came back and they picked for us the blessed hope Bible Presbyterian Church. A last day's church, a church looking to the imminent return of Jesus Christ upon earth. Right? And you see here that uh, we, we learn the truth right? from the dispensationalist in, in America, the doctrine of the last days. And that's how we receive that faith from beginning to the end. And, and we thank the Lord for showing us the truth. And so the founding principle learned the doctrines of the last days, the doctrines of the reformed faith, and he came back and he established uh, a Bible college. It is interesting, you know, uh, in the third missionary journey, you would see the establishment of a training school in Tyrrhenius in Ephesus where the Apostle Paul uh, stayed to teach the doctrines of God for two years. And here the Lord wants us to see how, you know, the, the imbibing of the faith uh, involves men and women to know their faith and to understand their faith and to have the heart to want to pass on that faith. So Aquila and Priscilla were with the Apostle Paul. And when the time came, they saw this promising young man right, who loved the Lord right, but did not know the Word of God so perfectly, well, they took him aside, share, nurture, mentor. And so that, you know, later on you would see how this man, Apollos, would uh, be uh, a soldier for the Lord. 
And so here in our text, uh, as we look at the progress of Christian missions, we see how it has to be, you know, uh, upon a man who is dedicated, devoted to the service of God. And how can it progress? Well, there must be men who are willing to mentor and disciple a next generation. We did not come here uh, to share the word with you uh, without someone taking time to nurture us in the Lord. I, I recall our pastoral advisor, Dr. To Siang Hua, who spent time together in the things of God, traveling and all these things, prayer and going to the Bible school to prepare so that we can invite and understand this doctrine, this faith that we have, this reform, fundamental, premillennial faith so that we can pass to a next generation. May God help us. May God help us to serve Him. May God give us a heart of, that is devoted so that we can grow in grace and the, and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we can be a blessing to the people around us, whether it's discipling our own children, discipling the people around us, whom God has brought our way. Uh, you see that this man, uh, Apollos, uh, was humble uh, in the sense that he was willing to take the counsel of uh, the two, you know, uh, a couple right, who loved the Lord. And finally, uh, you see how, um, and we would further study how Christian missions progress through dedicated men of God and also through the men of God who are willing to disciple others as God would raise men for his harvest field. May God be merciful to uh, strengthen the hands uh, of his people in this generation for his own honour and glory. Let us pray.